Section 1. You will hear a woman booking a room for a party at a community centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, good morning. My name's Pete. How can I help you? Hi, my name's Maria Lincoln. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties? The woman's first name is Maria. So, Maria has been written in the space. Now, the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, good morning. My name's Pete. How can I help you? Hi, my name's Maria Lincoln. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties? Yes, we do. We have various sized accommodation. It depends on what you're looking for, really. We're looking to hold a party, a children's birthday party, and we need a room that will hold about 70 people, with space for a small disco area, games, dancing and food. Well, we have a large room, and it would certainly hold at least a hundred people comfortably. It's used a lot for parties and things like that. That sounds as if it might be suitable. I've tried various venues, and they're either booked up or they don't hold enough people. Can you tell me when you were thinking of holding the party? I know it's short notice, but we wanted to hold it Saturday week. That's September 15th. Let's have a look. Uh, hmm, yes, you're in luck. The Mandela Suite is free then. I'll just write that down. M-A-N-D-E-L-A. -E and the time. When were you thinking of holding it? In the afternoon, from 3.30pm to 9pm. Yes, OK. There is no smoking on the premises, and we're only licensed to have soft drinks. Oh, that's OK. I think I'm happy to go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Can you just give your postcode? Yes, it's PA57GJ. Fine. And the flat and street number? It's flat number 40 and the street number is 35. OK, so that's flat 40, 35 Beaches Street. Yes, that's right. And a contact number? My landline is 223279 with the code. But I'll give you my mobile number, which is 07897293381. OK, 293381. Um, can you tell me how much it will cost? It's quite reasonable, actually. It's £115 for the hire of the room, with tables and chairs. But if you want to hire disco equipment, we've got a basic system with speakers and other equipment for £25. But there is no technician around in case anything goes wrong. And, of course, it's optional. Oh, that would save us carting something from home, but 
Maybe we should bring a spare sound system just in case. We've never had any problem with the system, but you might not want to take any chances. What about catering? Well, we had thought of getting everyone bringing something. We have someone who can do catering for nine pounds a head, including the cake if required. That's handy, but it's a lot as we have a fairly tight budget. So, you want to go ahead with the booking? Yes, certainly. OK. I need to take a deposit of £30, which is refundable. The balance needs to be paid two days before the event at the latest. Fine. You can cancel up to two days before, but after that you lose the deposit. We don't intend to cancel, but is there any insurance we can take out? Yes, there's a, a form here somewhere. How much? It's, uh, oh, let me see. It's only £9 for the 24-hour period, and that covers you for cancellation, damage, and injury. Well, at least we'd better have a look at it. How would you like to pay the deposit? Cash. I'll just give you a receipt. Uh, there you are. 10, 20, 30. 30 pounds. Uh, Maria Lincoln. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm really glad I found somewhere. We have been trying to book a place for the past two weeks, so thank you again, and uh, bye for now. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk on the radio about grass roofs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. And now it's straight into the eco hotspot for today's programme. We are in fact going to look at an intriguing trend in recent years in the world of eco-friendly developments. There has been a constant stream of new green products coming onto the market for the environmentally conscious. A new departure, which I feel needs greater attention drawn to it, is the increasing interest in grass roofs. Environmentalists sing the praises of grass roofs as interest in sustainable ecological building has led to the greening of the rooftops of residential and commercial buildings around the world. And what does this type of roof consist of? Instead of tiles, which allow water to run off and create flash flooding, the roof has a waterproof underlay, which is laid over the roof deck. This waterproof layer is then covered with layers for insulation and drainage. Then, on top of the insulation and drainage layer, is added a final layer of soil or crushed stones for the plants and or grass to grow on. The roof can be planted with wildflowers to add colour and life to your rooftop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 20. 
As for the benefits of grass roofs, in spring and in summer, they are very pretty as flowers spring into bloom. Moreover, in summer, grass roofs are of particular benefit in cities because they keep any building cool by reflecting the sun's rays. In winter, the grass roofs insulate the building, helping to prevent heat loss. The roofs require little maintenance and are better than any other roofing material. They encourage biodiversity by attracting bees and birds, and they absorb water runoff, which helps prevent flash flooding. In fact, the gravel layer retains 71% of the rainwater that falls, thus helping to prevent flash flooding. In winter, the brown soil is a bit more evident, which can look unattractive if the roofs are not tended carefully. But that is a price worth paying, and I would say that they come highly recommended by those who have them. If you compare grass roofs with tiles, the latter do certainly look very tidy, but at a price to the future of the planet. The main drawbacks of tiles, though, are the water runoff and the absorption of heat from the sun's rays in summer. So, if we are to save the planet from the ecological point of view, tiles do not come recommended. The only roof that I can think of which has similar ecological credentials to the grass roof is the thatched roof. Thatched roofs are good insulators and very attractive, but very pricey and not ideal for cities. How can we make more of our roofs green? That is, how can people be persuaded to install grass roofs? The World Green Roof Conference in Australia was a very good start. At a grass roots level, the best way to raise the profile of grass roofs is to make them trendy by highlighting them in fashionable magazines so that people begin to feel that they cannot do without them. But the idea I like best is holding competitions for the best designed grass roofs. Next week, Eco Hotspot is going to look at. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average. I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Mm -hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, 
but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material? When you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock. It's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it and we'll just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant, or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there, and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the work of a printing department at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I am here to give you a brief outline of the work of this new department. The Department of the Printed Word has a very short history, having been created just 10 years ago. Some statistics to start with. The first intake of undergraduate students consisted of 20 students, which rose to 37 in the second year. And we now have about 50 in the first year, doing a wide range of courses, full and part-time. We have a thriving research department, with 17 students on the taught MA course and 7 students doing research full-time. In all, we have nine full-time lecturers and 16 part-time lecturers who work mainly but not exclusively in our evening department. Of the total student body, approximately 21% are from outside the country, a number which has been increasing steadily over recent years. Although students from overseas have to reach a minimum level of competence in English before they follow a course at the university, some may require remedial help with their English, and we can offer help through the student support services as part of the general assistance given to all students. For home students, both graduate and undergraduate, there are bursaries to help with travel and accommodation, for which I would advise you to contact Mrs Riley at the end of this session. Increasingly, we are forging external links with organisations in the publishing world. And we have been very fortunate in that we have received money to sponsor not just various students within the department, but also technicians and lecturers. Each year we hold a series of lectures which are given by external speakers in the world of printing and the media. The series of workshops that you see around you have been built thanks to a very generous donation which has allowed us to develop our facilities for bookbinding and restoration. Now, the main work of the department relates to teaching the mechanism of printing. And as most printing is now so highly technological, all our students have to be computer literate. For those of you who are interested in taking a module in this department from another department and who feel that you may not have the necessary computer skills, don't let the technology put you off. We have a number of specialist technicians who can support and deliver crash programs in the computing technology required. As long as you can switch on the computer, you are halfway there. We have what can only be called state-of-the-art facilities, especially for those wishing to move into the publishing world, working not just as printers, but also in editing, page design, layout, and bookbinding. With the extensive facilities we have for book restoration, some of our former students are now employed as expert book restorers and conservationists, skills which were once almost dying out. In the display you will notice samples of work on book cover design, and as well as having all the necessary computer programs for dealing with printing, we have some old printing presses. Despite being largely a modern department, we do have an increasing interest in research into the history of the printed word, ranging from early European to Chinese and Japanese printing techniques. We have in fact some very well-known experts on early printing in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. If this area appeals to you, you can talk to Dr. Fred Clare afterwards. From China, we're lucky to have as a visiting lecturer Dr. Yu, who is an authority on early Chinese manuscripts and printing machines. If you are thinking about doing a module with us, or you are interested in doing research after you have finished your first degree, the person to talk to is Professor Clarkson, who will be able to give you all the details. For postgraduate research, you should really be thinking about applying now, even though we are only in December as the department now attracts large numbers of people and we always have many applications for each research position. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.